Hello everyone and welcome to this talk, The Climate Crisis and Human Vulnerability to Hazards. I'm Dr Natasha Dowie, I'm a Senior Lecturer in Geography and Environmental Science at Sheffield Hallam University. I've got interests in volcanology and social justice in geoscience. We are now all painfully familiar with the ongoing climate crisis. The most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change states that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere and biosphere have occurred. We also know that the climate crisis is causing weather and climate extremes. The IPCC report that evidence of observed changes and extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts and tropical cyclones, and in particular, their attribution to human influence has strengthened. But what does this mean to society's vulnerability to hazards? First of all, let's define what we mean by hazard. In this talk, I'm considering environmental hazards. These can be broadly seen as either climate related, be that meteorological or hydrological, such as storms, floods and droughts, and geophysical of the earth, such as earthquakes, volcanoes and landslides. Environmental hazards often seem to dominate our lives and the world's media, with the last two years alone seeing major bushfire events in Australia, heat waves in North America, major flooding across Europe, serious landslides in Asia, and a deadly volcanic eruption in Africa. Environmental hazards occur all over the world, as this sobering list of countries most at risk from floods, heat waves, droughts, cyclones and sea level rise portrays. However, although globally distributed, the impacts of environmental disasters are disproportionately felt in low income countries. For the period 1998 to 2017, the countries most impacted by environmental disasters in terms of annual percentage of their gross domestic product were mostly lower to middle income countries, with the exception of Puerto Rico, which falls into the higher category because it is a territory of the USA. Richer countries may lose more money to hazards, but in terms of their overall economy, lower income countries fare much worse. This is due to vulnerability, which we will define in a moment. The IPCC states that weather and climate extremes are worsening, but are environmental disasters becoming more frequent? The simple answer is yes, shown in this chart from the Institute for Economics and Peace. But note, this graph is summarising all hazard types. Is this the case across the board? After all, how can climate change make more volcanoes erupt? When we see a similar graph broken down by geophysical versus climate related, we can see that geophysical disasters are not necessarily increasing through time. So let's briefly explore the question, will climate change put us at a greater risk of geophysical hazards? To consider the answer to this question, we need to think about risk. What is risk? The first thing to understand is that risk is the probability of something. A volcano is a hazard. Risk is the probability that that hazard will harm us. Risk is based on a number of factors. The first is the nature of the hazard itself. This may be a volcano, it may be a storm, it may be a flood. What are its characteristics? How has this hazard behaved in the past in this area? What can science tell us about this hazard? The next factor is exposure. What people or assets or infrastructure are exposed to this hazard? And the final factor is vulnerability. How vulnerable are those people or assets? Vulnerability is complex and is dependent on a series of social, economic, political, demographic and cultural factors. It can be viewed on a national level or on an individual level. We have already explained that the frequency of geophysical hazards is not necessarily increasing due to climate change. But what about these other factors? Let's look at the example of volcanic hazards. 
society's exposure to volcanic hazards has increased as a result of population growth and urbanisation, and at least 600 million people now live in areas potentially at risk from volcanic hazards. This figure shows the direction and distances of some major cities from volcanoes. Note that in Auckland, 418,000 people live on top of its potentially dangerous volcano. In Arequipa, Peru, over 800,000 people live within 25 kilometres of El Misti volcano, shown here. Many of these examples occur in lower income countries, which are more vulnerable due to a variety of socioeconomic factors. Now let's think about how this picture may change due to the climate crisis. It's been reported that a 2.1 metre rise in sea level would permanently cover land that is currently home to 200 million people around the world. This will doubtlessly lead to displacement of those people, as will the impacts of droughts and famines in some areas. More and more people may be forced to live in areas exposed to environmental hazard, thus increasing their risk. We have used volcanoes here as an example, but this same logic could be applied to a number of examples, whether that be rapid urbanisation that leads to poorly built homes in landslide prone areas or higher population densities in areas subject to flooding. So what can we do about it? Those working in geography, earth and environmental science are uniquely placed to be part of tackling these challenges. In this brief talk, I will just give a few of my own personal perspectives from volcanology, with the caveat that they are a narrow glimpse at a huge field. For geophysical hazards, such as volcanoes, we often use the rock record to understand how they behave. Deadly hazards like pyroclastic density currents, as shown here, deposit material which ends up looking like this. We can analyse rocks from eruptions hundreds of thousands of years ago to build a picture of a volcano's behaviour through time, which can help hazard assessments. But there is uncertainty in those interpretations because we are unable to get inside those hot clouds of ash and rock to fully understand how they behave. Therefore, a key role of scientists is to better understand these hazards and to reduce uncertainties. Our group have been working on this challenge by modelling density currents in a laboratory to understand how they behave. And here's an example of some of that work. A density current in a flume building up deposits in a very similar way to how a real density current would create rocks. We also need to cross the divide between physical and social science to better understand how hazard analysis and communication is interpreted by communities and how it impacts behaviours. One of our research students has recently been considering how press releases from scientific organisations are translated by media companies and how these are then interpreted by the public. As you can see, this difference in tone and language can be dramatic. In the first example, of the USGS press release, there's a real spread of different terms like activity, crater, summit, volcanoes, earthquakes, whereas in this Daily Mirror article, a UK uh, newspaper, you can see words like flea and killer and race becoming more prominent in the article. In this world of rapid communication by social media and media, ensuring effective communication during crises and about hazards has never been more essential. My final brief perspective is that we need more equity in everything that we do. Equity so that those most vulnerable to environmental hazards are not left behind. Equity so that those working in hazard prone regions are working in equitable partnerships and are supported to carry out essential work and equity in the workforce so that anyone from any background has the opportunity to tackle these issues. What needs to happen is best summarised in the UN Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Disaster Risk Reduction, or DRR, is the practice of reducing the risk of disaster through systematic efforts to analyse and manage the factors that cause disasters. The framework set out a series of goals to achieve this, through various strands, including reductions in mortality, in economic impacts, in damage to infrastructure, and through increasing international cooperation and risk reduction strategies. 
to face the challenges posed by increasing frequency and intensity of some environmental hazards and increasing exposure and vulnerability to all environmental hazards, we need to mitigate climate change. We need to understand the intrinsic connections between our communities and the environments in which we live. We also need to invest in prediction and response. We need to adapt to changing conditions and crucially work across disciplines, social scientists, physical scientists, engineers, local responders, politicians and governance at a variety of levels. All of this is needed to reduce our vulnerability to environmental hazards in a rapidly changing world. Thank you.